is Jewish Spotlight, a weekly television program presented by Chabad Lubavitch of Long Island, featuring various aspects of modern Jewish life and Jewish culture. Now, here is your host, Rabbi Tuvia Teldin. Shalom, and welcome to the Jewish Spotlight. Just a couple of seconds ago, you saw a picture of the Western Wall, a place in Jerusalem that the world considers to be one of the holiest sites that world religions consider to exist. And of course, for the Jewish people, it is the most religious site, a site that dates back to the times of Adam and Eve, a site that dates back to the creation of the world, to the place where Abraham was ready to sacrifice Isaac and where Jacob, in his dream, saw the ladder going straight up to the heavens. And it's a site that has become also perhaps the most controversial real estate that the world knows of, a place that three religions claim to have a hold on the holiness of this site that is so inherent in its very being. For those of you who have been to Israel and have visited Jerusalem, know the power of this site and know the presence that is felt when one stands next to the wall and next to the holy presence that we feel there. However, unfortunately, this site has turned into a place of controversy a place of tremendous strife where different religions struggle for control. And it's a cause of tremendous concern for people throughout the world because it's literally or potentially a cinder box just waiting to be ignited. As a result, it's important, I think, for all of us to understand what exactly is going on in that mountain. What exactly is the history of that mountain? And what is the Jewish claim to having so much of our history in that mountain? And we're very honored to have with us today somebody we had on the show many, many years ago, a very, very special guest, somebody who's looked up to greatly as a scholar in the Jewish community, a person who knows a tremendous amount about the history of this particular area, about archaeological finds, a world-renowned expert in the Dead Sea Scrolls and a professor, uh, the, really the head of the Judaic and Hebrew Studies Department at NYU. It's a pleasure to have with us Professor Lawrence Schiffman. Thank professor you. Schiffman. Pleasure again to have you with us. Thank you very much. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about this topic because, of course, for all of us in the Jewish religion, that small little piece of real estate means so much and has so much significance to it. Tell us a little bit about the history of that area as far as what the archaeologists, for instance, have found in the area and what's been verified to be part of Jewish history in that small little block of the world. The first thing that has to be realized about this area is that way, way back from about the year 1000 BCE, King David had located his shrine in Jerusalem, and King Solomon decided on this particular plot, which was understood to be a kind of almost buffer zone between the northern and southern tribes, to set up there his basically tabernacle, and then Solomon put the actual, David set the tabernacle, and Solomon put there the actual temple building. Now, going That's about the, how many years now? We're yeah, talking about about 1,000 years BCE that this took place. Okay, fine. So we're going which over 3,000 years right. ago. Right. Now, we are talking about what we call the first temple now. That was placed on the Temple Mount. That structure survived until it was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE when they destroyed Judea and exiled the Jewish people. Now, in 540 BCE, when Cyrus the Great, who was the king of Persia right. and Medea, told the Jews that they could go back to the land of Israel, under the leadership of the last of the prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, they started from 540 on to 520 preparations for the second temple. And in 520, they dedicated the second temple. Now, that temple was on that same spot. Now, unfortunately for us, because of the great building project of King Herod, which produced the Temple Mount we have. We don't have archaeological remains from the first temple and what you might call the early second temple. There's nothing at all that exists. There's nothing the time that the first we temple. know of except the possibility of this inscription that was recently discussed that, for better or for worse, most scholars now think may be a fake. This inscription about King Joash, Yehoash in Hebrew. With the exception of that possibility, we don't have remnants because of the fact that when King Herod who ruled over Judea as a Roman client king from 38 BCE to 4 BCE, when he built what we today call the Temple Mount, as we see it when we go to visit, which is the area that the Arabs call the Haram Asharif, the Temple Mount, that was built by him by leveling the top of the mountain and <coughs> building walls and making a platform by filling in a tremendous amount of dirt. Uh -huh. In doing so, he produced this whole gigantic platform that held the temple 
in Roman times, and that's the temple that was destroyed in 70 of our era during the Jewish revolt against Rome. Now, that destruction in 70 is considered to be the beginning of the latest Jewish exile, an exile which we consider That's to continue right. until today. To continue right up until today. Right. Okay, fine. And we, we, we await the time that the temple hopefully will be rebuilt, which would be through the Jewish belief of Mashiach, a descendant of King David, who will come back to Jerusalem in order to do that. In the meantime, of course, there are some things going on in that temple which are very controversial, which most of the public is not aware of. And I'd like you to share with our public what is happening as far as the Arab digs that are going on on the Temple Mount against all right. law and uh, literally a travesty of uh, but we have to understand. Facts. We have to understand that up until 1967, of course, between 48 and 67, this territory was under the control of Jordan. Because, of course, as most people know, in 1948, when the British left the mandate, they simply abandoned right. a, a mandate, which means a trust, to set up a Jewish state. That's what they were put there for after World War I by the League of Nations. When they abandoned that because they couldn't deal with the Arabs and the Jews and couldn't settle it, so Jordan invaded. As a result of that, Jordan ended up holding East Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount. Jews, according to the armistice agreements, that were signed between 49 and 50, were supposed to have access to the Temple Mount, as well as access to Mount Scopus, which was Hadassah Hospital in the Hebrew mm -hmm. University. No matter what, the Jordanians did not allow that access to the religious shrines in East Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, and they allowed very minimal ceremonial access to Mount Scopus. Now, as a result of that, Jews were denied entry for the whole period from 67 until from 48 to 67. Now, during that period, the Arabs wrecked cemeteries there. Synagogues. They, synagogues. They wrecked the whole area around the mount and built instead all kinds of little houses. In 67, when Israel came in, what they decided to do was to allow the Arabs to continue control of the mosques on the top of the mount, because those mosques had been built in the Middle Ages. They were their holy places. And Israel thought that the way to reach accommodation with the Arabs was to grant everyone religious freedom. And they allowed what's called the Waqf, which is a Muslim holy society, a corporation, to continue to run that. And they decided that the area that the Jews prayed in, which was called the Wailing Wall originally, and they began to call it the Western Wall because once we had taken it back, we didn't have to wail and we didn't have to cry anymore. <laughs> right. And Wailing Wall was a kind of anti-Semitic name for it, really. Despite the fact that the British had often denied the Jews' right of praying there, despite the fact that the Arabs had denied the Jews' right of praying there from 48 to 67, Israel decided to return there, and I think you can never forget those pictures, not only of the Israeli soldiers who conquered it, but also those pictures of the first festival of Shavuot after the 67 war and those early days where there were, you know, literally three quarters of a million people coming there. Yeah, and they it was cleaned, time. Right, and they cleaned out all of these later structures to create what we today call the, basically, the Kotel Square, the Rehavata Kotel, right. where people now go to visit and to pray. Now, after doing that, they left the Arabs alone. What happened a few years ago is that the Arabs decided to embark on a simultaneous policy of number one, expansion of the mosque facilities, and number two, obliteration of Jewish remains. The obliteration of Jewish remains meant to remove those structures still on or below the Temple Mount, which proved that it had been the Jewish temple in the time of Herod on. So all kinds of Roman period Jewish structures were being removed. Stones were being thrown out, walls were being obliterated, and that because at that time Jews were still allowed to visit there before the first intifada, mm -hmm. so people knew this was going on. And this started in about 1995 oh, I was, or so? Even earlier than that. It actually started in the late 80s. It wasn't really? so clear to people. And when, along with this process, they started a decision which in and of itself might not have been so bad to dig out underneath the mount and to create a larger mosque. Now, what happened here, it's this an underground area, mosque. Underground mosque in an area called Solomon Stables. But what then happened was the following. Simultaneously, A, removal of Jewish remains again, right. being thrown into a dump outside that archaeologists went to and pulled out architectural and archaeological remains of the Jewish period, all intended to disprove Jewish rights and the history of the place. So the archaeologists place. do know where they're dumping the things that they're taking yes, out of there. Yes, they, they And know. they have access to it? Yes, and they went there and they got stuff. 
So they but, must continually be able to find new things. Well, things yeah, really but, but the problem is they have to compete with antiquities, people who steal it already inside the Temple Mount, the workers. Antiquity salespeople and all this kind of stuff. Really? And it's all so it's getting like on the black market. On, yeah. Now, the but other, why can't Israel stop them okay, from doing so this? Okay, so in order to understand this, it's necessary to understand they're simultaneously destroying Jewish remains and building this mosque. And we should also mention that they also caused a tremendous danger to the southern wall, which is today in, in danger and is being repaired by a Jordanian group. But the point is, the reason that Israel cannot do anything about it is because perhaps of a tactical error. The Israelis didn't want the building to go on, but they didn't have the nerve to stop it, and therefore they elected to follow a pattern of ignoring it and hence not granting it a building permit. Had they granted it a building permit, they could have supervised it. Having ignored it, they had the situation where the trucks were rolling in, the trucks were rolling out, right. and nobody was supervising from a safety or archaeological point of view. The archaeologists were yelling how terrible this was, Eventually, the wall started to come out on the southern wall and started to become dangerous. At that point, the Israeli authorities finally stepped in. They forbade the police, actually, forbade the access to trucks to stop stuff from going in and going out. They sent various people to investigate, eventually brought in the Jordanians in some kind of agreement to repair the wall. And the fact is, however, that we still have no way of knowing the extent to which they're digging up small remains and destroying them. Every time you see somebody throwing stones up there, those stones could be some Second Temple right. Jewish remains. Now, it's clear what is really going on here. The government faces major, major problems in uh, many ways. They don't want to be perceived as interfering with the practice of religion in the holy site. They don't want to set off some kind of an explosion. And, of course, we all know that the Arabs have the false claim that the visit by Sharon, right, was now the cause of the Prime Minister Sharon, was the cause to because the West. Because he went up in the So they don't want to make this problem worse. And also when the tunnels were built, that was also caused well, other yeah. riots, the which tunnel caused thing about 87 Yeah, deaths. the tunnel thing was absolutely crazy. This was under Netanyahu. Uh, there's been an I, I've been through the tunnels. Yes, the tunnels it has nothing, nothing to, do. to do with the Temple Mount, exactly. nothing to do with the Arabs. It's all on the outside, and it doesn't matter. There were riots, and there were people who were killed as a result of this rioting because the Arabs just wanted to riot over this. Now, the point is, therefore, the Israelis are afraid to put a stop to this. Right, because it shows that anything that goes on in Temple Mount is now, so sensitive now, that it cause a big problem. There's one part of this that's almost a joke. Today, we're hearing the Palestinians claim that this is not the site of the Jewish Temple. But there's one problem. Why should an Arab, a Muslim, think this place is holy? There's only one reason. Because according to their tradition, Mohammed had a vision that he went to the Temple Mount which was the Jewish Temple Mount, called in Arabic Al-Quds, the Holy, and ascended from there to heaven. So according to Muslim tradition, the reason they value this place is because it's our Temple Mount. Just as, of course, Christians value this place because they know that Jesus did not go, he went into the temple and also walked on the pavements all around the temple because right. this was Jerusalem of his time. So to deny the Jewishness of this place just as Christians know that that would be absurd for their history, for Muslims, it's totally absurd. And yet they are working day and night to obliterate the remains of the Jewish presence on the Temple Mount. And their eventual goal, once they feel confident that they've done that. Well, I'm not, I tell you the honest truth, I'm not really sure. They're going to keep expanding the mosques. They're going to take away all these things. They think somehow they're going to convince the world that it's really true, that it's not the Jewish Temple. Now, I have to tell you what's interesting is there is nobody in the world Who's who believes believe this? That? No, exactly. for a lot and, of and let's what just, kind of political yeah, let's they're pause get to point out some of the reasons. Josephus, in his history, writing in about the year 100 after the destruction of the temple, describes the Temple Mount, the exact architecture, the exact number of gates, the exact location of every structure, the nature of the pavements. We have excavated all around the outside the pavements. We they found the inscriptions that say that non-Jews cannot go any further in the Temple Mount. They have found an inscription which indicates where the shofar and the trumpets were blown from the corner of the Temple Mount. And we can go on and on. All types of structures, water drainage structures, water supply structures that are known from Josephus to have existed in the Second Temple, all been found right there. Right. There is nobody under the sun who with any kind of rationality who is going to deny this except some type of absolute propagandist. Interesting. Interesting. So tell me, as far as their eventual goal, let's say to wipe out any type of Jewish appearance in right. Jerusalem, 
then they can come to the world population and say that we want our capital to be in this area. And this is never the Jewish capital. The Jewish right. Jews were never no here in Jerusalem. Whatsoever. Right. Uh, like you say, the UN's not going to believe it. No one's going to believe it. No one's going to believe it whatsoever. Yeah. So is it just coming out of a hatred for the Jewish people that they're doing this? It's hard. And the people who are behind this. The it, it's actually hard to tell. There is a major, major problem that is written about by the great scholar of Near Eastern and Middle Eastern studies, Bernard Lewis, in a, in a fantastic book called Semites and Anti-Semites, in which he chronicles the transfer of the really hardcore anti-Semitism, the, the Jewish conspiracy, all these protocols they all designed, which have all been disproven, all known to be fake. He chronicles how after World War II, and especially in the period leading up also, but, but most intensely since 67, that the Arabs have absorbed this kind of real strong racial anti-Semitism that has been really almost killed, certainly in our country it's, it, it's gone, and, and almost killed in, in Europe even, right. because this is so irrational. And this anti-Semitism has been exported to parts of the Arab world and he chronicles this in great detail, that the things that Arabs say about Jews, and we know that very recently there were television programs in Egypt which acted out the protocols of the elders right. of Zion, which has been totally proven to be a falsehood. Now, the thing is that what this shows is that the anti-Semitism level is probably at the point among some of their leadership to bring about, certainly among the Palestinians, a blindness to reality. And because the tradition that they've now absorbed which is not the old idea that Jews are second class under Islam or something like that. This is a racial anti-Semitism, a real hatred. They may believe that somehow they can expunge Jewish memory from this place totally. But the problem with it is the reason it can't happen, no matter what, is because of Christianity. Because Christianity sees this very site as the important place for stories that they have, like Jesus turning over the tables of the money changers, all these things happen in the area of the temple, and everybody knows it's a temple. So this is a, a hopeless, blind hatred, but I just want to point out, I think anybody who asks very serious questions about why we're in the situation we're in now, in between Israel and the Palestinians, will realize that the recent actions that they took didn't have any rational basis. The this denial of the Barak peace offer, no rational basis. The refusal of the Syrians, when they were offered the whole thing back in return for nothing but, as they call it now, a warm peace, true open borders. None of this can be understood rationally, and therefore the attempt to explain rationally how anybody can really believe that eventually it will totally wipe out mm -hmm. the Jewish presence from that location, right. it doesn't make any sense at all, but nonetheless they're <coughs> mm -hmm. bent on doing oh, it. Oh yeah, they're bent on doing it, there's no question about it. Tell me, I want to get back to some of the archaeological finds, because it's very fascinating as far as the history of the Temple Mount itself. And I know there have been some major discoveries. Can you go a little bit into those discoveries as far as how we see uh, our, you know, from a, a Jewish traditional right. perspective, we have the Mishnah, we have the Talmud, right. we have descriptions which date back in our tradition 2,000 right. years. To see archaeological right. proofs come to we the have surface really, yeah, we is have really fascinating. Two major sets of descriptions of the Temple Mount. One is the Mishnah, one is Josephus. The two of them are not exactly the same. There are some different opinions about why, but they basically describe very similar things. There's some measurements and here or there, different things like that. So just to give some small examples. In the Mishnah, we have description of the gates that surround. In the front, we have on one side three gates, that is to say the real front of the temple, right. which is the area that we would call the southern wall today, which is, by the way, the one bulging because of the, right. the mess they made inside. So there we find that you have three gates on one side, two gates on the other side. This is exactly the way it's described. The gates enter not the top floor, they enter below and you go upstairs. This is exactly the way it was described in the Talmudic sources. Can you give our viewers a little bit of idea of the majesty of this building? Well, you're talking here about a platform which held one of the largest buildings that exists. The Mishnah says that the Temple Mount was about 500 by 500 cubits. That would be 750 feet by 750 feet. In fact, King Herod apparently elongated it more. So it comes to something more than 1,000 feet by 750 feet. It's almost rectangular. In ancient times, if you looked up from below, you would have seen balustrades going all around. These balustrades had beautiful columns and stuff like this, what you saw from the outside. If you entered into the Temple Mount, you were in the, the larger courtyard. You would walk from this into what was known as the Temple Building itself, the women's court, which wasn't only for women, because men also went through. Then you would go further, always going up steps, 
and further and further in as you approach the temple. The idea being that you are going through a spiritual ascent into which greater and greater levels of ritual purity are required. Right. And so you understood what you were doing as ascending spiritually until the point when, unless you were a Kohen, a priest, you couldn't go any further. And there inside was the actual temple understood to be not the real house of God, because God is everywhere, but the place that symbolized God's presence in the earth and the place in which the Jew could always find God's presence. Now, right. That was the Holy of Holies. Right. And that would be where the actual tablets would be located. Well, there would have been the first temple. The first right. temple. Second temple, they were hidden. Gone. And uh, for those, all of those out there who are fans of Raiders of the Lost Ark, right. the Jewish belief is that the tablets are really not in the FBI headquarters in right. Washington, but they're hidden somewhere under that right. mountain. <laughs> Now, in the end of this thing, when you finally you know, got there, your main purpose was, of course, to pray and bring your sacrifices. We know that prayer was there all the time, right? not just in the Second Temple, not just after it was destroyed, and, of course, the sacrifices that were brought in the various offerings. Now, the beauty of the thing can be seen, for example, in the model of the Holy Land Hotel, where you actually get some sense of what a beautiful structure this was. And... In essence, the whole experience of being there and seeing the parades of the priests and the beautiful clothing and all this kind of thing was a tremendously spiritual experience right. that people shared in. Now, this was considered one of the wonders of the world. When the temple was destroyed in 70 of our era during the great Jewish revolt against Rome, which was 66 to 73, 73 Masada was destroyed. That brought it to a close. When that took place, they were still working on it because it had started in 18 BCE with King Herod. Interesting. And he was, they were still working. And Josephus describes this thing and the beauty of this thing, along with the Mishnah. You put these two accounts together, you just have an, an unbelievable structure destroyed by the Romans. In fact, by the way, Josephus, and admittedly, he's writing to try and excuse the Romans, but he says that the Roman commander Titus didn't want it destroyed. And he blames various people for its being destroyed, but he says that, that Titus did not want it destroyed. He wanted to preserve it because it was such a beautiful and inspiring building. Interesting. So what are some of the archaeological finds that you've heard about that so, bring about a, more of an understanding of that era? When we speak about the second temple, from which we have quite a lot of finds, the entire water supply system has been uncovered. They have uncovered right, the pavements that. that go all around the temple. Okay. You have these you have also mikvahs. You have the yes. ritual baths. All, all over the upper city, where many priests lived, which was on the other side of the hill, which is today the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, there are ritual baths in almost all the houses because people regularly went to the temple, observed all the laws of ritual purity. Then when you actually get to the temple complex itself, there are other ritual baths, which you can see if you go to what is called the southern wall excavations, which you can also see where that bulging wall is. Now... One of the most exciting things, I think, is to see the pavement level because you realize that when you stand at the hotel and pray, you're in the middle of the wall. That wall, if you look at right. some of those holes that they've dug there, goes down another... Oh, it's amazing. It's, yeah, it goes down 60 feet in some places. So right. then you have to imagine what it was like looking up. And up in the absolute corner on the southwestern wall, you had these stairs that came down, and you also had all along the building of the temple where the western wall by the way remember is the outside of the temple courtyard all along there you had sort of these arched structures which is where you would go in order to buy a sacrifice or to prepare yourself in the mikvahs there to go into the temple and so all of this was connected with the whole temple structure so and the of course one those thing are areas where the great rabbis would be meeting where they would be walking and Right. I remember going through the tunnels. The tunnels right. literally are, are just a tunnel that goes along the along side, the wall, along, right. the wall, along the wall, along the western you, wall, from one end to the other end. Right. And of course, that, according to that war, wall, as you get to the end of it, you actually are stepping on one of the actual streets that existed yeah. during that time. So you're walking on the same street that all these people, Hillel, and all the, yeah, all the that all these people, people walked, right. walked on. Now, one other thing that I want to, that I, that I want to mention. So then, for first temple times, they announced just this idea that an inscription was found for King Yehoash, and everybody went crazy because this would have been the first item taken out of there from right. first temple times, unquestionably of first temple times. The problem is that many scholars now believe, despite the laboratory reports about the way the stone was incised, that the language of the inscription, which has been all over the Israeli papers, I, I don't think it's really made the American papers yet, and the language of this inscription, which is in Hebrew, 
seems to betray the knowledge of modern Hebrew by the person who wrote it. Really? And it's now been believed by virtually all scholars to be a forgery. Let me tell you what it was, why it would have been so great if it was true. In the 9th century BCE, the king of Judah was a certain young man who started at age 7 named Yehoash. He had been hidden by priests during a purge of paganizing type priests and kings. This was the purge of Yehu, called in English Jehu. After this happened, the Kohanim, the priest, brought out the seven-year-old and said, he's the legitimate heir, make him the king. So they put him up as a king, and one of the things that he's credited with doing is complaining to the priests that they weren't properly taking money collected and using it to repair a breach in the temple. The inscription purports to be an inscription in which he states that he criticized the priests. He told them to get the money together, and he told them to fix the breach in the temple. Interesting. The would have been a fantastic proof of a whole set of biblical history. Unfortunately, the letter shapes seem to be out of date somehow. The Hebrew language seems to, as I say, betray modern Hebrew. And virtually everyone is now saying that it's a very sophisticated forgery, and the lab that claimed it was correct and, and true is now saying, well, if it was forged, then the guy was a real expert. And so I have to unfortunately say many people have been talking about this inscription right. and the hope that it would disprove all of this Arab propaganda, that it doesn't seem like it's a well, real listen, thing. There's no question we have enough information to disprove their propaganda. The question is, hopefully, when we will be able to get more and more of, right. the, of the invaluable antiquities that are hidden there that I'm sure are still under the ground somewhere. It's just a matter of time before we'll be well, able to maybe reach them and, this is and, the question and bring, whether the, bring we'll to ever, the light what exactly what is going on there. Will we ever be able to excavate underneath, and is there anything left underneath that they haven't ruined right. to, to, to excavate? And, right. of course, we're right. never going to know unless yeah. things change radically. Well, listen, let's, uh, let's hope that things do change radically and go for the better. Professor Schiffman, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate your sharing your knowledge with us, and uh, we look forward to having you on again for the show. Meantime, I just want to say to everybody else, if you haven't been to Israel and seen this beautiful, beautiful city of Jerusalem, you're missing something. And I know it's a time very people are very nervous about going to the Holy Land, but it's a time for sure that we need to give strength and inspiration to the people there who truly, truly are, are, are touched by every single American who touches foot on the land of Israel because of our financial support, our moral support, and it's important at this time more than ever. And believe me, you'll go to the Holy Land, you'll go to the city of Jerusalem, and go to the, to the Temple Mount, you'll feel something you cannot feel any place else in the world. So in the meantime, go out and do a mitzvah, do something good in your life to make the world a better place, and together we can help to really make the world the type of world God meant for it to be in the first place. Shalom, we'll see you next week at the Jewish Spotlight. Yeah.